Hello there and welcome to a GCSE History Revision tutorial. We're going to look at some Paper 1 material and we'll look at the historic environment, the British sector on the Western Front and our topic today is going to be the development in treatment of injuries. We'll have a look at four areas of problems in this video. We'll look firstly at the problem of infection, the problem of blood loss, problems of face wounds and lastly problems of fragments going inside the body. And for each of these areas, we'll have a look firstly at the existing problem at the start of the war. Then we'll have a look at how things developed. And then lastly, we'll have a look at the impact of these developments, seeing if there is any improvement over the four years of the war. Let's start with infection. So at the start of the war, it was very common for wounds to be infected a major problem was gas gangrene. Now this was where wounds um, became infected with bacteria that had been trapped inside the body, taken into it by the projectile that had gone into the soldier. They'd often taken in mud or filth from the battlefield, particularly at Ypres, or had just simply taken in fragments of cloth from soldiers' uniforms inside the body. And the bacteria that were trapped inside the body could lead to a quick and very painful death. And so many soldiers were dying from avoidable infections by the time they could be operated on. Now, halfway through the war, two British surgeons, Alexis Carroll and Henry Daking, developed the carroll Dakin method, in which a chemical was pumped through the infected area. It was a salt-based chemical. And this would give short-term um, protection against infection. But this was only um, effective for about six hours or so, but it did buy some crucial hours. Secondly, surgeons got better at cutting away more tissue around wounds, making sure that they left no infected areas. And this was just a development in practice as the war continued and they got more used to operating on the same types of injury. And thirdly, by 1916, in casualty clearing stations, there were specialist teams of surgeons who were used to working on specific parts of the body or specific types of wound, so they got better at their practice. So the impact of this was a large reduction as the war carried on of amputations, the removal of limbs that were needed. Secondly, the problem of blood loss. At the start of the war, 80% of broken legs resulted in the soldier's death through bleeding to death. Secondly, blood could not be stored towards the front lines. And this resulted in major shortages of blood during large scale battles. Now these problems were countered with a few developments. With the problem of broken leg wounds, Hugh Thomas, a British surgeon, developed the Thomas splint in 1916. This is a fairly straightforward technique and you can see it in the picture. The soldier's leg was held straight to reduce bleeding and this was effective in preventing them from dying in a majority of cases. Now secondly the problem of not having enough blood near the front lines. Now this was a problem of transferring existing knowledge and technology into the environment of the front lines. So by 1915, it was known that blood could be effectively stored. A US surgeon called Lewison had discovered this. However, it took until 1917 for blood transfusions to be effectively done and carried out effectively towards the front lines. By the time of the Battle of Cambrai in late 1917, the British Army had an effective blood bank in preparation before the battle took place. But this was the first time that this had happened. And as you know, that's towards the end of the First World War. But the impact of these developments is quite marked. And as you can see, broken leg mortality fell from 80% down to 20% with use of the Thomas splint. And from the end of 1917 onwards, 
effective blood transfusions became increasingly possible to be performed at casualty clearing stations rather than back at base hospitals. Thirdly, the problem of face wounds. Now, at the start of the war, maiming was very common. Soldiers suffered from bullets and shrapnel wounds, shards of metal, and head injuries were very common. Now, at the start of the war, soldiers were issued with cloth caps. It's only from 1915 that they were given uh, the metal Brody helmet to use. But developments in technique really helped this most feared of injuries. So from 1915, some skin grafts became possible. Now, of course, these weren't performed towards the front lines. They were only performed back at base hospitals and only specialist ones at that. And from 1917, a New Zealand uh, surgeon called Harold Gillies set up the Queen's Hospital in Kent in England. And this specialised in facial wounds. Now, Gillies had been um, involved even in the design of the hospital and it was at this place that he um, developed lots of different specialist um, operations. But of course this only took place with soldiers that made it all the way back through the evacuation route. None of this was possible near the front lines. But the impact of this was crucial for the soldiers that had survived their terrible injuries. Now by 1915 11,000 reconstructive operations had, complete, had been completed and this increased steadily towards the end of the war. OK, lastly, the problem of fragments inside the body. Now, of course, with high explosives, metal pieces being lodged inside the body became a major surgical problem. Now, at the start of the war, X-ray machines, although they were existing technology, were really rare. The British Army only had two machines in total um, in 1914. So this would be another problem of getting existing technology into the challenging environment of the Western Front trenches. Crucial to this would be portable and transportable X-ray machines. So quickly the government ordered many X-ray machines to be built and mobile X-ray units on lorries and vans were produced in large quantities. And by 1916, most casualty clearing stations had X-ray machines at them, and all base hospitals did. However, this is fairly early in X-ray technology, so some of these machines were unreliable, they would often overheat, and again, there was a the problem of getting soldiers X-rayed quickly enough so their wounds wouldn't be infected with the uh, fragments that were inside them. So if we just try to piece together some of the key developments that we've looked at against the major battles of the war, you can see that 1916, two years into the war, is a major kind of breakthrough year here. This is the year of the Carol Dakey method, when X-ray machines start to become widely available at casualty clearing stations, and we have use of the Thomas Splint. Now, 1916, of course, coincides with the Battle of the Somme. But the problem that soldiers would have with the scale of the injuries that there were would be having access quickly enough to these life saving techniques. Now, in 1917, we have three major battles, two of them here Arras and Passchendaele, the third Battle of Ypres. Now, by this time, yes, blood transfusions were available and could be performed. But it's only at the Battle of Cambrai in November 19, uh, 1917 that a blood bank was ready before a major offensive took place. And again, you can see that it only happens towards the end of the war. So here's how we might use some of this knowledge. Now here you can see two described form art questions. The top one is taken from a previous examination paper. The second one is just one that I've mocked up. So you might use describe two key features of blood transfusions on the Western Front during the First World War. And you can maybe use that as a framework to describe other features. So maybe a treating fragment wounds, for example. 
Now remember, we have to describe two key features. And if you're struggling under the pressure of time or during the examination, what you might like to do is to compare treatments and techniques at the start of the war compared to the treatment and its impact during the war. And if you remember, the key developments that we've looked at really only happened from 1916 onwards. So you might use that information. OK, that brings us to the end. Thanks for watching. There's lots of other revision materials and exam technique guides for you on the CHSG History YouTube channel.